Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll pause for just a minute to let everyone get logged in, and then we will get started with the official program. And for those just logging in, we'll pause another 30 seconds or so and let everyone get on into the session and we will start promptly. Well, an official good evening, everyone, and welcome, friends. My name is Denny Nicholson, and I proudly serve as the Assistant Dean of Admissions at Syracuse University. I'm joined tonight by my friend and colleague, uh, Missy Math Mathis Hanlon. She's the Director of Parent and Family Services. And uh, it's our intent to, to tell you a little bit about the university, but also share some information about what... Uh, you know, what our students should expect moving forward, but not only our students, but also our parents and family members, um, as you are all now officially uh, members of the Orange family. So uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, a big welcome from our Orange family to each and every one of your families out there. Uh, and congratulations, uh, not just to the students, but to our parents and guardians and all those who played a role in the student's success in being admitted to Syracuse. It's been quite a year. Uh, we received nearly 45,000 applications for the coveted 3,750 spaces in our first year class this year. So uh, quite an accomplishment for all the students who've been admitted and for all those who are on this you know, call tonight. So really a, a sincere note of congratulations and, and great work inside and out the, outside the classroom for those applicants. So uh, we are going to jump right in. Missy and I plan to chat for about 20 minutes, give you a brief uh, overview of the university and some things you might expect. Um, as parents in particular, as that tends to be our main focus for this session. And then we are going to open it up for Q&A. My colleague, uh, Mike McGrath, is going to team me up and, and also team Missy up with some questions that you might be putting into the chat. So we encourage you to utilize that throughout the session. Uh, we also, in addition to Mike McGrath from our admission team, we also have April Lynch from our admission team. And many of you uh, in the audience have, have met Mike and April throughout the process. But uh, uh, they do so much for us, and I just want to pause and thank the two of them. Uh, today's a light day for us. We had 39 events uh, for Syracuse admissions today. So to give you some context of what they've been up to, and that's a slow day in the month of April for us. So um, it's day and night. It's 24-7. And uh, thanks to both Mike and April for taking time out of their day. And of course, and, and their evening rather, and, and Missy, of course for joining us as well. So I'd love to share a little bit about uh, our university and what you might expect moving forward. So some of the things, let's start right here uh, with our first slide of our beautiful university. And I know many of you have visited Syracuse over the past couple of years. And this is our beautiful campus home to uh, Syracuse University, a medium-sized university with 15,000 undergraduate students. And we have quite a history. Syracuse has been around for 154 years. And in many ways for our university, it's been 154 years of first. We've been pioneering and groundbreaking in so many different ways. And I'd love to share some of that history with you because very few know of, of the, the true history of Syracuse. But 154 years ago, uh, higher education was at a real crossroads where predominantly we were educating all white males in the liberal arts and uh, other universities were coming on board that were more career focused at that time, uh, but yet mostly for male students as well. And on came Syracuse, along came Syracuse University, uh, and somewhat pioneering in, in a sense in that we decided to combine all those things and open our doors to all people, men and women from the onset. 
Um, so we opened our doors to men and women. We created this university with great liberal arts, the hub of the experience at Syracuse University is the College of Arts and Sciences, where all students are required to take courses, surrounded by nine undergraduate schools and colleges that have great focus on careers. And so we've blended those two things. Other aspects of our history that I find really compelling, and, and, and hopefully you would as well, uh, that shortly after World War II, um, Syracuse University doubled its enrollment and how we did that. The chancellor at the time had the foresight and the vision that the young men returning from World War II uh, would become the future leaders of our country and found an opportunity to have those students. And he, he was instrumental uh, with the author, with um, writing the and, and assisting in the GI Bill and all that was going on with that. And so with all that said, Syracuse University welcomed over 7,000 veterans to our campus to pursue their higher education after they returned from the war. And it transformed the university and something that remains true to us to this day. In fact, to celebrate our 150th anniversary four years ago, uh, we erected and opened a $61 million National Veteran Resource Center for our student veterans and families. And it serves as a hub of research activity on the veteran and military family front. So and we've been ranked as high as the number one uh, university, private university in the nation for veteran and military families. So really proud of, uh, of that history with Syracuse. We're the first university with an information study school. So some of you in the audience this evening have been admitted into uh, the iSchool as we refer to it at Syracuse. Uh, so again, pioneering in so many different ways, proud of our Syracuse University. Uh, at Syracuse, uh, all of our students uh, must apply to a particular school or college. So in this case, all of the students have been admitted into at least one school or college. Okay. And some of you, some of the students have been admitted to two schools and colleges because they applied for dual enrollment, which allowed them to be admitted into different majors within two different schools or colleges. The majority of our students have been admitted into a single program at the university. Uh, and I wanted to showcase the breadth of majors and minors. We have 200 majors to choose from at the university, along with 100 minors. For anyone who has visited our campus or knows students at Syracuse, a common theme is that they graduate with more than one major, and that comes in various shapes and forms. Uh, they major in um, one, they, they double major within the same school or college. They have two majors from two different schools and colleges. They have a major in one school or college with two minors from two additional schools and colleges. And all of that is in play for our students at Syracuse. The key concept here for your students is they enter the university with one school or college predominantly, in some cases two, and they build upon that throughout their years at Syracuse University. And they'll customize their academic plans with help from our career advisors, our academic advisors, and our peer advisors. At Syracuse University, every student will have a career advisor, an academic advisor, and a peer, an, an upper class student at Syracuse, all within their school or college who work only with students within their school or college. So an example, the student is admitted into the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Their career academic and peer advisors only work with students within the College of Engineering and Computer Science. So there's tremendous focus when it comes to careers and internships, the academic environment. They're very familiar, obviously, with all the required courses within the Engineering and Computer Science program and advising for courses outside that particular realm of academics as well, including the other schools and colleges. And then they have a peer advisor, not just for academics, but for other factors. Um, they're contemplating a particular course and that peer advisor might be able to get some insight uh, from, from their own experiences. Or in some simple cases, where's the best place to get food off campus, right? That's what our peer advisors are there for, to provide general peer-to-peer -peer advice. 
Syracuse is proudly a research one university. I often say um, Syracuse is R1 and D1. Many of you are familiar with D1 athletics. We're proudly part of the Atlantic Coast Conference uh, where we play amazing academic and athletic institutions. Uh, oftentimes uh, students are less familiar with the idea of research one. And so there are 130 or so research one universities around the nation. And as you might expect, universities are also research one or R1, R2, and R3, much like athletics. And on the research side, we're also at the very highest level research one. So annually, there's somewhere around $100 million in various grants that come to the university. And our faculty and our students, frankly, are the beneficiaries of that great research. Syracuse is well known for our great uh, internships and study abroad programs, as well as our immersion programs. And I'd like to comment on all three of those. I'll start with study abroad. Uh, it's, a, it's a core element of the experience at Syracuse University. In fact, we own and operate five centers around the globe. Uh, and they include Florence, Madrid, Strasbourg, Santiago, Chile, as well as London. And so many of our students spend a semester or perhaps in some cases a full year abroad. Some of you on the call this evening um, are perhaps part of our discovery program and will be spending your first semester in a study abroad experience. Uh, approximately 50% of our students have a global experience. It's at the forefront of a Syracuse University undergraduate experience. In addition to our five centers that we own and operate, we're part of the World Partner Program. So there are another 100 programs offered in 60 different countries uh, that students can participate in where we partner with other universities. So it's pretty safe to say uh, a student at Syracuse can virtually get anywhere around the world that they would like to during their undergrad days. In terms of immersion programs and internships, uh, I'll, I'll use that particular sequence because immersion programs often preempt internships. Our immersion programs often take place in the sophomore and junior year, followed by internships. And our schools and colleges are actively engaged in these immersion programs that take place in uh, on fall breaks, winter breaks, and spring breaks, where we take students out to meet our alumni in their particular areas of academic interest. I speak with uh, my own daughter's experience having recently graduated from Syracuse University uh, as a, an accounting and business analytics double major. In her sophomore year, she took advantage of an immersion program down in New York City where she spent her fall break meeting alums who worked for the big four. So they visited the big four accounting firms. They also spent some time at Google uh, and also spent a half day at the New York Stock Exchange uh, for a variety of experiences. But she was an accounting major and had a chance to meet up with the big four. Uh, within a week, she had offers at all four big fours for an internship for the following summer after her junior year. So really a year and a, a, year and a half in advance. And so that's what happens oftentimes with these immersion programs, uh, all fully funded by the university and our students have great experiences and they meet with our, our orange network and they get connected for future internships. Internships then taking place oftentimes in the junior year, uh, summer between junior and senior year and throughout the senior year, most common. Shared competencies. So uh, several years ago, in fact, uh, in 2023, we finished our most recent strategic plan. And as part of that strategic plan, the university identified six core competencies. And these are areas of extreme focus at the university that uh, your child uh, can expect during their experience at Syracuse University as it's part of our curriculum. It's part of our co-curricular experience at Syracuse. Uh, as well. And, and I'd like to, to share some of those. And our goal is that uh, our students obviously are, are going to walk out of Syracuse uh, having experienced these six core competencies. And not only can they talk about the six core competencies or shared competencies, uh, but rather they live them in their work experiences. Uh, and, and they can articulate those to future employers as well uh, in those job interviews. And they include ethics, integrity, and a commitment to diversity and inclusion, critical and creative thinking, scientific inquiry and research skills, civic and global responsibility, 
communication skills, information literacy and technology agility. And so they're going to have an opportunity when meeting with their academic advisors to register for courses that may focus in particular areas of, of our shared competencies. We also have what's called CLASS, the Center for Learning and Student Success. So all of our students have a chance uh, to participate in um, peer tutoring, professional tutoring, uh, large group tutoring, smaller group tutoring, um, a, a wide range of opportunities to help ensure their academic success at Syracuse. At Syracuse, for anyone who's visited, you probably heard the phrase, an unsurpassed student experience. My interpretation of that is that no one does it better than Syracuse University. You should expect an unsurpassed student experience. And outside the classroom, uh, you can see here uh, a, a rock climbing wall within our state-of-the-art Barnes Center at the Arch. Let me start by, by saying Syracuse has over 350 clubs and organizations that we offer. If the students are bored at Syracuse, they are probably boring. There's no other way to say it. There's so much to be involved with. The Barn Center at the Arch is a great example where we have a rock climbing wall, as you can see. Uh, but it, it, it's really one of the state-of-the-art facilities. In fact, we're one of two uh, universities in the nation with a concept that I'll share with you. At most universities, if students are sick, they go to the health center. And to work out, they go to the fitness center. And to meet with uh, a counselor, they go to the counseling center. At Syracuse University, they go to the barn center because it's all there in one place. And so that's where we have our mental health counselors. We have pet therapy dogs. We have a mind spa. Students can reserve time in the mind spa. We have on the recreation side, not only our rock climbing wall, but uh, three stories of fitness equipment and a track and four basketball courts. We have a gaming center uh, for esports enthusiasts and so much more within the Barn Center at the Arch. Our doctors and nurses are available for our students who are sick. So all of that in one great location. Uh, it opened in 2019. For context, in 2018, we had 70,000 visitors in our fitness center throughout the academic year. Just this past year, we had 90,000 visitors in the month of September. Okay, so it's been transformative for our students in the experience, and it is truly unsurpassed. For those who visited our campus, um, I think you're probably hard pressed that you would have seen a better facility on another college campus. In terms of the living experience, uh, I know many of you are signed up for tomorrow evening's housing session. There is a virtual session being offered. You know, if you have not registered, we encourage you to consider that opportunity. Uh, we do have 21 residence halls uh, for 10 of them are reserved for our first year students. Our first year students um, are housed on the main campus. So you will be very close to all of uh, the academic enterprise at the university and all of your classes nearby. Our housing policy, uh, students who uh, are beyond a commutable distance loosely defined. If you live beyond a half an hour from the university, it's our general expectation that you're going to live with us for your first two years, and then you will have an opportunity to move off campus should you desire. And for reference, that tends to be about 50% of our students who do in fact move off campus after the sophomore year. And of course, the other 50% decide to live and remain with us on the, on the campus. Uh, and 98% of our first year students will live in a double room. And those are what we call open doubles. In the top of this particular slide, you can see an open double. And then we have split doubles where there's a, a small partition down the middle of the room. So a little bit more privacy. Uh, but generally speaking, our, our first year students are going to be looking at a residence hall room similar to what you can see on the screen. We also have robust living learning communities. You're going to learn a great deal about that in the coming weeks and months uh, with the opportunity for students to sign up for a living learning community as part of the housing process. And uh, that, that's basically common interest housing, housing. Oftentimes that common interest is an academic major. 
but that is not always the case. Sometimes it's simply a common interest that happens to be on the co-curricular side. Uh, robust information on our website, and I'm sure um, uh, Mike or April can put that information on the uh, on the chat so you can begin to learn a little bit more about those opportunities. In terms of the dining centers, uh, as diverse as our student body in terms of the food option, it's a student body that hails from 89 countries and um, in 49 states. So it's a real academic uh, enterprise and a diverse one at that. And uh, again, our, our food mirrors the diversity of our students. Uh, and there are 20 different places to eat on campus. Uh, the roommate selection process takes place uh, you know, in the coming months as students begin to uh, secure their enrollment at Syracuse. So uh, you'll learn more about the roommate selection process later on. There are opportunities to fill out forms and questionnaires um, and an app that students can sign up for to learn more about other students uh, that can potentially be matched with them for roommates and they can do some self-selecting there. Uh, so that's a, a great opportunity. And in fact, uh, you know, a student, a student may have a roommate in mind already and they can, if both students indicate on their, their housing contract, we can make that happen as well. Uh, Syracuse, our alums, how they do. Uh, our students get great jobs when they graduate. And in fact, uh, our most recent graduating class, 89% of them had a job full-time or were enrolled in graduate school within six months. You can see the average starting salary here and you can see the top employers from the class of 2023 coming out of Syracuse University. Worth mentioning is also our Forever Orange Scholarship because many of those students return to Syracuse to spend an extra year or perhaps an extra couple of years to continue their master's or PhD programs. For students who decide to continue directly on to a master's program at Syracuse University, and in select programs at the university, they are eligible for the Forever Orange Scholarship, which is a guaranteed 50% tuition discount for a graduate program at the university if they go directly from undergrad to grad. And again, uh, that is for select graduate programs, not for all. I am going to stop and turn it over to my, my friend and colleague, Missy Mathis Hanlon, uh, and she will tell you a little bit uh, from the parent perspective. Missy, it's all you. Thank you, Denny. <laughs> so really, I just want to give you a, a general overview of what our office does, and then I'll, I'll go through this slide a little bit. Um, our primary focus is communicating with families, and that's from the time your student uh, accepts their admission to the university through the time that they graduate. We actually work with you um, through the entire process. Um, we also do special event planning, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, in a moment. And we're a general resource and referral office. So if there's you know, a concern that you have that your students uh, having a challenge with something and you need some resource information, we're very happy to work with you to problem solve and, and make referrals around campus. We have, uh, we're, I guess, rich in resources and have good networks um, through our office. So new student and family communication, we begin in May, shortly after that May 1st um, <clears throat> deadline for matriculation to the university. And we have a special communication portal that's called the Orange Family Connection Portal. Um, if any of you happen to be early decision families, you may already have your name entered into that portal uh, if we had access to your email address. As your student confirms admission, we would add you into that uh, communication portal, but really look for weekly uh, emails for the most part during the summer. Um, we, as I said, provide family resources for the student's entire undergraduate career. Uh, we plan family orientation during our welcome week, which is August 19th through 25th. Um, the family orientation this year will be on Wednesday evening of that week. And families are invited to stay for the new student convocation which is the following morning in the Dome. Uh, Family Weekend is another one of our major events. Uh, it's in the end of September this year. The schedule varies from year to year um, and we choose a date based on the football schedule. So uh, we're playing Holy Cross that weekend, if that matters to anyone. 
But our contact information is here. You can uh, search the university's website for parent and family services and find uh, our website with more details. Thank you, Missy. And I'm going to finish up with just a little bit about financial aid. Um, this is not a, a financial aid session and I don't wanna turn it into that, but I certainly think it's important to talk a little bit about financial aid um, as many of you are going through that process now. And uh, it, it's been a, a source of frustration and reaching national news with the FAFSA issues this year. So I'd like to make a few general comments. Uh, in terms of affordability and our process at Syracuse. So um, for the students who've been admitted uh, to the university and are applying for need-based aid and were able to submit the CSS profile, we have been sending out estimated financial aid awards. Okay, we did that for our early decision students, and we have been doing that for our regular decision admitted students, and they will continue to go out as CSS profiles are received. Okay. Many of you have also completed the FAFSA form and uh, most are familiar with uh, what's going on with the FAFSA these days. The federal government has had uh, significant challenges, although uh, simplifying the FAFSA, it perhaps has turned into a little bit more than they had expected in terms of challenges and snags. So we, along with every university, uh, ask for your patience and we will try to, hide, uh, to, to help and guide as best as possible. We are at the moment um, you know, sticking with the May 1 response date at Syracuse, um, but we will have uh, extensive flexibility regarding that date for any family who has not received a financial aid award from Syracuse University. You simply reach out to us and request an extension. It wouldn't be fair for us um, to request any sort of deposit uh, to the university unless you've had an opportunity to review the financial aid award. So uh, please remain patient uh, as best you can as we get closer to May 1st if you have not received an award and filled out the FAFSA and CSS profiles. Uh, please reach out to us and we'll, we'll extend some flexibility. We do have robust scholarships and many of you are recipients of the scholarships. We have student employment or um, that, that may be in many of these financial aid awards. So it's not uncommon for our students to have jobs on campus where most of the offices on campus employ students, um, in, including Missy's office, including our office um, to help support those students uh, so they can have a wage uh, and help with some expenses for the university. We also have tremendous financial literacy uh, opportunities for all of our students to take advantage of during their time at Syracuse. So um, uh, more to come on, on financial aid. We're a resource for you, uh, but the primary resource uh, for questions would be directly to the financial aid office, and we encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, if I can help in any way, and our team can help in any way, yeah, each of our admitted students, when they go to their um, to their applicant portal, they are met with a friendly, smiling face, and that is one of our admission team members and contact information uh, for that for that uh, admission representative, and that's their counselor responsible for them, and they can reach out to their their counselor. Of course, uh, my smiling face will always be available to you should you you desire. Um, so don't hesitate to shoot me an email uh, right on our website and perhaps Mike or April can put it into the chat uh, is uh, a meet my representative page where you'll see our entire staff, my, my face being one of them, and you're all welcome and I'm frankly encouraged to reach out to me with questions as well. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike who's monitoring um, the Q&A and, and will ask us any questions. Uh, and we'll 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 get to the answers. Thank you, Denny, and thank you, Missy. Uh, first question we have is going to be for Missy. Can you talk a little bit about the academic advising process and when students can begin to hear uh, from their advisors? Generally, they should start hearing um, from the university about their registration and advising process sometime in the mid to late May. 
Um, every school or college has a slightly different process. Um, and so it's going to depend on which school or college your student is a part of, but they will have numbers and email addresses available to reach out for assistance and help with, with the process for each of the schools and colleges. Um, and then going from there, some of the schools and colleges, they will tell your student who their advisor is very early on in the process. Some of them wait until a little bit later in the summer uh, to find out who their advisor is. It really, you know, sometimes depends on the size of the school or college, as you can imagine, our College of Arts and Sciences is, is our largest uh, college. And so sometimes it takes a little bit more time to make all of those assignments, but um, they should have that information fairly quickly, but have plenty of resource information. Thanks, Missy. Um, next question is for Denny. Can you talk a little bit about the honors program? Um, and specifically, is it too late to apply? It's Michael. It is not too late to apply. In fact, students will have the opportunity um, to go on the honors program website and be met with the application. Mike, is that up and live at this point or not quite yet? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, it is available to our students. Go right to the honors website and there is an opportunity to apply. Frankly, there are three entry points to our honors program. I'd like to address all of those and then just tell you very briefly about honors. The entry points would be some of you in the audience, uh, some of the students or, or children of the parents in the audience, uh, have were admitted to Syracuse and within the body of the admission notification were also offered the opportunity to be in the honors program. Uh, if you were not one of those individuals, the second opportunity is to go on the honors program website and fill out the honors program application for consideration. Those decisions are made in the middle of April and students are notified uh, a week or so in advance of the May 1 deadline. And so you'll be aware uh, of the fact that you've been admitted or not into the honors program. So that may, may be a factor in your ultimate decision. There's also a third entry point. For some students, it's after they get to Syracuse and they're now in their first year and decide, I'd really like to pursue the honors program. They can then apply uh, via the honors application for entry uh, into the honors program. So those are the three entry points. Uh, there are four courses that students have to take that are, uh, I believe, HNS prefixed courses. Uh, there are uh, over 100 honors courses offered at the university. Students have to pick four of them. Uh, they can choose as many as they would like. I'm very proud uh, that my daughter was part of the honors program and took seven honors courses during her undergraduate days. And so those courses are capped at 20 students. So that's one of the advantages of honors kept to 20 students. They do a major research project in their senior year. Uh, they get some advanced course registration benefits, so they're able to register a little bit ahead of their peers. Um, so a countless benefits uh, to being in the honors program. So um, if you're looking for the, the, the ultimate challenge academically, uh, honors is, is a great thing to, to consider. Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> a question for Missy. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how to find um, hotels here in the Syracuse, New York area? I know that's always a question our parents have. Uh, I mean, next week with the eclipse is going to be a big challenge. But beyond that, you know, how can families find um, places for them to stay while they're visiting their students? The best rule of thumb is to use the Visit Syracuse website. It's visitsyracuse.com or visitsyracuse.org. Um, they think they use, use both of those uh, URLs. Um, they are our local convention and visitors bureau and all of the information about local hotels is there. You know, certainly you can reach out um, and, and ask us questions about um, locations and those sorts of things. Um, but honestly, we live here and so we don't frequent the hotels and, and don't really know as much about them as you would think. So visit Syracuse is an excellent resource. Thanks, Missy. Uh, Denny, a question about uh, financial aid. Is it too late to apply? It is not too late to apply, Mike. Uh, I simply urge any family out there uh, that hasn't done so to do so uh, very promptly. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Missy, there, there's a couple questions about roommates. Um, first off, what happens if a student doesn't select a roommate in the housing application process? It, that's totally fine. In fact, um, there are many students that will go into the process without a roommate and that's 
absolutely fine. And it, I'll be honest with you, I've worked at the university for 27 years. And I think that the people who are matched up randomly um, end up you know, being roommates and perhaps friends later usually get along a little bit better. Sometimes, you know, somebody from camp or someone that you, you grew paired up with as a roommate. And that's great. It's good um, initially to know somebody uh, at the university, but it sometimes causes complications with communication about problems in the room. So, you know, one person's a night owl, one person um, likes to get their sleep and it can snowball from there because they're not great at communicating. <laughs> And that's a lead into our next question is what happens then when communication maybe does break down between a roommate and yourself as a student? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of support around you when you're living in a residence hall. You have an RA, is the, an upper division student who, li who lives and works on your floor. Um, we have residence directors who are professional staff members that live in the residence halls and that can uh, you know, have office hours, help students on a regular basis. Um, but one of the things that we do is we have the students work on a living agreement as soon as they arrive on campus. So within the first couple of weeks, they're talking about some of the issues that they might face and how they're going to address those. Um, so the place to start if they have an issue is with their RA, and then the RA will help them escalate that as needed. Denny, uh, a couple of questions have come through about the dual enrollment options available to students here at Syracuse. Um, specifically, when it comes to advising, who works with the student? Um, is it depending on the program they're admitted to? How does that happen? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I want to address a lot of things here. So first of all, the advising. So there is, a, in fact, a home college designated for every dual program. Uh, but those students will have advisors available to them in both schools or colleges, part of the dual uh, program. Uh, also worth mentioning, uh, we don't have dual relationships between all of our schools and colleges. It's a select group of dual programs that are offered. What's very plausible and also very common at Syracuse is that a student arrives and decides, as I mentioned earlier, to pick up another major or a minor, in another school or college. And that is a normal process at Syracuse. And uh, you'll have your advisor in your home school or college and they will walk you through the process of applying for a second major in another school or college or a minor in another school or college. We also have students who arrive in one school or college, and can you imagine occasionally they actually change their mind and want a different major in another school or college, and so they go through a process called intra-university transfer, or as we affectionately refer to it at Syracuse as IUT. And so they're, the, all of the academic advisors to each of the 10 schools and colleges are well-versed. The process is slightly different. Uh, perhaps April can, or Mike can put some information in the chat about um, intra-university transfer. So at least it's available to, to our audience, uh, but there are, are different stipulations depending upon uh, where you'd like to go after you're at Syracuse. Thanks, Teddy. Uh, and on that, you you mentioned sometimes students are coming in not really fully sure of what they're looking to do. Um, can you talk a little bit specifically within the College of Arts and Sciences, um, the advising to undecided students as we do see uh, a high percentage of arts and science students arrive undecided? Yeah, so first, first I'd say that within 10 of our schools, uh, of the 10 schools and colleges at the undergraduate level, seven of them have undecided options within their schools or colleges. As Mike alluded to, arts and sciences undecided is the largest volume of undecided students. And in that particular case, in arts and sciences in the Maxwell School, they have what's called explorer advisors. And that's frankly their role. They work with students who are undecided. Uh, and so that's their area of expertise. So they're doing self-interest inventories and uh, spending a lot of time with those students to try and discern uh, likes and, and, and dislikes as importantly, uh, and perhaps some passions or areas of academic interest. And also it's part of their job to expose them perhaps to some things they've never even heard of. There are thousands of courses offered at the university. Our educational system around the world is geared toward generally, at least in the United States, 
five core areas of English, math, science, history, and foreign language. And you come to a university at, uh, like Syracuse and you're exposed to a lot more than those five core areas. Um, so they, they spend a great deal of, uh, of time with those students and exploring. Um, a few questions have come up about the move-in process um, orientation. We are actually doing a separate session with our um, Office of New Student Programs next Wednesday. Uh, as much as Missy and Denny would love to talk in depth about that process, um, really that office is the expert. I'm putting a link uh, in the chat for that that is going to be on Wednesday, April 10th uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, and then there's also a follow-up session on Wednesday, April 24th at 7 p.m. if you cannot make next week. Um, but uh, we will not be covering that process tonight. But one thing there are questions about Missy that I'd love for you to answer is transportation. Um, not only how do students get around campus, but how do they get from, say, the airport or the bus station to campus? Well, it's all a little bit tricky, but, um, you know, I would say on campus particularly, we have, um, if, you've, if you've been to visit campus, you've seen probably large buses and a whole army of, of trolleys that are SU branded um, that uh, help students get around campus from South Campus to North Campus, vice versa, to um, the warehouse, which is a, a downtown facility, uh, to Syracuse Stage, where some students will also have classes. So they are readily available, and they're available um, almost 24 hours a day in some cases. There, there's a short window of time during the middle of the night, um, the wee hours of the morning when they may not be available. Now, as far as getting from the airport to campus and vice versa, that's mostly um, the job of Uber and Lyft these days. There will be some times that the Student Association may sponsor free shuttles that take students both to our regional transportation center, and that's where Amtrak, Greyhound, Trailways leave from, um, and the airport, because they're both in the same direction. So that, that's usually around Thanksgiving, around spring break. Sometimes at the end of the semester and the beginning of the semester, they'll also run those shuttles, but um, be on the lookout for more information about that in the fall. Now, if they want to get to a grocery store and things like that, there are certainly bus lines that come through campus, but Student Association also sponsors periodic, usually about once a month or what, uh, uh, twice a month, buses to places like Wegmans, uh, which is a supermarket, and um, Target. Thanks, Missy. Um, Denny, there's a few questions about studying abroad. Um, one is, when is the earliest somebody can study abroad? And there is a clear answer for that. Um, and related to that is a question about the discovery program. Uh, and when do they start to get information about uh, in um, life here at Syracuse University after their first semester abroad? Yeah, great question. So yeah, you, you, um, you're feeding me, Mike, into that first semester study abroad program. So uh, the earliest one can study abroad is, in fact, the first semester freshman year. And it sounds like we have a student or parent in the audience uh, where the student is going to participate in that discovery program. Uh, we offer discovery at three of our five centers um, in that first semester, and those are in Strasbourg, Florence, and Madrid. And so students, uh, it, it, it really depends, but generally speaking, uh, while those students are abroad in their first uh, semester experience, it's not uncommon for staff members from the main campus in Syracuse to fly over to the centers, including our academic advisors, to meet with those students and begin discussions uh, about acclimation back to the main campus in the spring semester, building their course schedules, uh, and of course the resources in those three centers because they deal with this all the time, are working really closely uh, with those students and with the partners back on the main campus in terms of acclimation. We do a, a very special um, uh, orientation program, so to speak, for those students who are coming to campus for the first time in the spring semester, including all of our Discovery students. So in terms of getting involved in clubs and organizations, uh, we have a lot of special uh, programming revolving around that uh, for those students to make that uh, transition as smooth as possible. So uh, uh, going back to the original question, how early first semester freshman year, most common is probably in the junior year. 
uh, but students uh, can study abroad from first semester freshman year until last semester senior year, and they can do it on some of their short term breaks. Uh, we have various programs. We have summer programs. Uh, the sky's the limit with, with study abroad at Syracuse. It will be discussed with every student who, who meets with an academic advisor at Syracuse. We want every single student at Syracuse University to have a global opportunity. And we support as much as we can financially to make that feasible. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Missy, two questions for you. First, maybe an easier one. Um, when should parents plan to leave during Welcome Week? So, well, we've tried to make it kind of convenient for you, um, you know, since you'll be moving your student in earlier in the week. Um, Wednesday evening is going to be the orientation for families. And we will live stream that if you choose to leave a little bit earlier. Um, the new student convocation is something you're welcome to attend, and that's on Thursday morning. That afternoon, some of the schools and colleges will have open houses. We may have a session or two for families available, but really at any time after that new student convocation is when you should plan to leave. I would be surprised to see any family member here any longer than Thursday evening. And then a follow-up, well, not really follow-up, another question for you, Missy, is about safety. Um, can you talk a little bit about the safety measures that exist on campus to make sure that our students are being cared for? Yeah, you know, I think one of the most important things for you all to know about is um, the Orange Safe app, which is something that your student can load right on their phone. Um, it allows them to have immediate contact with our emergency communication center on campus, which is essentially the 911 of our campus. Um, and directly connect with public safety. You've probably seen the blue light system around campus and maybe at other campuses you visited where um, there are call boxes available and such like that. Um, the phone app actually works like um, a mobile version of a, of a blue light so they can activate at any time um, and have either one way or two way communication with um, public safety. You know, if they're in a, a difficult to speak situation, um, they can hear what's happening in whatever room they might be in or location they might be in. Um, so that is an important thing. Um, certainly public safety has um, lots of wonderful offerings about you know ways for their, um, their staff members and their officers to get involved. They meet students at the residence halls. Um, there's residential security in every building 24-7. Um, um, we have lots of cameras around campus, uh, you know, lots of information available on that public safety website. If they want to know more, there's actually a community police academy, essentially, where they um, offer the chance for students, faculty, and staff to get to know more about their department over a four or five week period. And um, you'll learn lots more about it. You'll be getting uh, more information from us and from new student programs. But that Orange Safe app is key. Thanks, Missy. Um, Denny, you had mentioned about 50% of students choose to live off campus after their sophomore year. Um, how far is off campus? Yeah, for, for our students, uh, it's very close. So envision a bullseye at the very center uh, of the bullseye or the dartboard is, is the academic enterprise and surrounding that uh, basically all the um, housing and food and then I guess there's another ring around all of that, which is kind of the uh, the periphery of the campus or, or just off campus, which is where most of the additional housing is. Um, so it's not uncommon. Uh, from my own daughter's experience living two years off campus, uh, she walked uh, to all of her classes and, you know, she was two, three blocks from the main center of campus. So that's pretty common, uh, uncommon for our students to live beyond a mile from from the campus during those final two years. And I think that's a unique feature of Syracuse. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, last two questions I have are from Missy. Missy, um, in terms of accommodations for housing, are students able to request a single room? That's going to be a good question. I think one of the questions that they've asked recently on the housing application is whether you'd be willing to live in a single room. Many of the uh, students coming to college really want that roommate experience. So I think that that's how they've phrased it. Um, I can't tell you that with 100% accuracy this year on the housing application, 
but usually if you check the box that you're willing to live in a single, um, that certainly becomes an opportunity for you. Um, if you have um, need for accommodations related to, you know, some challenging circumstance in your life, you can work with the Center for Disability Resources related to that. Um, and your student basically would um, submit some paperwork about um, diagnoses or whatever that might be. They will set up a meeting with you and then you go through a process with them. They actually run um, the process that allows for, um, for accommodations um, for the housing office. Thanks, Missy. And we are actually doing a virtual session with the Center for Disability Resources on April 17th at 7 p.m. And I'll put the information for the website in the chat. Uh, and last question is about technology. Um, do students have to provide their own laptop or is there opportunities for them to be able to rent or use computers or laptops while they're at Syracuse? You know, I think the vast majority of students do bring their own laptop or, you know, device, um, technology device, I will say, um, because not all of them are laptops, but um, there there still do exist some computer labs, what is what I, I guess I will call them around campus, where there are public computers available. You'll see some of them, um, for instance, just in open areas in the Shrine Student Center where students can access um, uh, their accounts on campus, et cetera. Um, so for the most part, I think they do just for convenience sake, but I would say that it shouldn't be an impediment if a student does not have their own technology, there's usually plenty of places around campus to access that. Thanks, Missy. Uh, that seems to be all the questions we've received tonight. Some thanks, Mike. I'll do some wrap up here. I just wanted to uh, inform everyone in the audience uh, over the next three weeks, the admission office will literally be all over the world. So we may be hosting events in your region of the world. Uh, please go on our website. We'd love to see you at one of our many events, including our admitted student events. Uh, parents and guardians certainly welcome to join students at those off-campus venues. Um, so please take a look at those. It's a great way to connect with other students who might be attending Syracuse University in the fall from your region of the world. Uh, if you are planning to visit our campus, uh, I can only encourage you to get registered for an on-campus event as soon as possible because they do fill up. There's huge demand, as you might imagine, and we have to close out. So some of them are already at capacity. All of them eventually will be at capacity. So I just urge you to do your planning. Of course, put Syracuse at the top of your list and make that visit first, uh, and we'll do our very best to accommodate you. Uh, so start to take a look at our campus visit options. Uh, love to see you in person for a quick hello at one of our many events. Um, uh, you have four friends here on the call and hopefully four trusted resources. Don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, and you should expect prompt replies with hopefully accurate and good information to help all the parents and all the students navigate this process. So thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. I want to give another shout out to April, Mike, Missy, who are so busy uh, and, and do an awesome job with this. So uh, tremendously grateful for all that you do. And uh, I hope to see all of you that are out here in the program tonight. Hope to see you in person on campus over the next month. And go Orange. Have a great evening.